the rim. Today's video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Kevin Durant is likely on his way to his third championship in a few months. He's got two of them already with the finals MVPs to match, he's got a regular season MVP, and is clearly one of the greatest offensive players if not the greatest to ever touch a basketball. And if nothing else was clear from the start, his potential to do everything mentioned definitely was. He came into the league averaging 20 points a game, and by his third season at the age of 21, he was already leading the league in scoring. And so, the question then becomes, how could any franchise have ever fathomed taking somebody before him? By the way he played at the height he touted, what on earth could have convinced anyone that there was a better choice out there? Well, I'm willing to bet that for the last 12 years, you've heard the same stories. Oh, Greg Oden was the sure thing. Anybody would have taken Oden first. You can't blame the Blazers. And maybe you can't blame them for their decision and how they came to it. But there was certainly enough information present to make it questionable, and it definitely wasn't as clear cut as history has made it out to be. You'll understand why after we hop in the time machine to find out how Portland made their final decision. Then we'll discuss what became of Odin's career and what he's been up to. So here we are in 2007, and although the Blazers are coming off of a 32 win season, their roster composition is more or less set in a way that it'd be best if they had some groundbreaking center. Brandon Roy is fresh off of winning Rookie of the Year, so he looks like their perimeter star of the future. LaMarcus Aldridge will fill in for Zach Randolph at the 4, so now they need to make the best use possible of that number 1 pick. Of course, with the two best players looking to be Durant and Odin, they're pretty much set with the choice of a center or another perimeter player. But how else do they make that decision? Just leaving it at, oh they have Brandon Roy. That's not good enough considering star ball handlers on opposite side of the wings would be awesome if they could make it work. So it makes sense to start out with the draft workout information. Durant comes into the workouts as the only player who can't even bench 185 pounds. Not that weightlifting prowess always directly translate into functional strength on the court, but nevertheless, not a good start when looking at strength compared to Odin. And while Odin doesn't perform the bench press not wanting to re-injure his wrist, he outdoes Durant in the vertical leap, agility drill, and the three-quarter sprint. Furthermore, he's being described as an absolute freak of nature. His body fat percentage is 7.8% compared to big men already in the league that are running closer to 13. Odin is also 6 foot 11 and 257 pounds. He's got a 7'4 wingspan and a standing reach of nearly 9.5 feet which is the highest out of anybody in this draft. So he outweighs Durant by 40 pounds, somehow jumps higher, and he's beating him in agility drills. On top of that, there's plenty of perimeter players that score in lows throughout college only to struggle at the professional level. Gigantic players that are highly mobile though? That's special and it may never come around again. Also, consider the teams that have won all the recent championships. For a majority of the 2000s to this point, it's been a team with either Shaq or Tim Duncan. Why would you not try to follow in those footsteps by taking another big guy who looks like he's got next? So far, there are no reasons to take Durant over Odin if you're Portland. But that's only if you're looking at the surface. First off, there is a gigantic red flag. Odin's right leg is shorter than his left due to hip surgery when he was in middle school. That hip surgery led to a condition where sometimes his leg would need to be tugged on to fit inside the hip socket properly. Maybe he'll be okay, but when you think about longevity, running up and down an NBA court for years, and repeatedly jumping and landing with the world's best athletes, that just might heighten the chance for injury, just maybe. Next, does he actually want to be a basketball player? Did anybody look at that? Or did his size just push him in this direction? He's literally on record in an ESPN interview saying that his life's dream was to be a dentist, and that his size advantage in basketball has actually gotten in the way of his aspirations. I mean, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be a dentist, sure, but most kids getting ready to be drafted are talking about how it's this fulfillment of a lifelong dream. Hell, Kevin Durant said the first time he stepped on a basketball court, it was like the gates of heaven opened up. He's wanted to hoop every single chance he's got. He really loves this shit. Deeper research should have been done at the psychological level, because Ohio State's assistant is on record saying, quote, he really needed to be a 5'11 bookworm. That references the idea that Odin was really only playing basketball because of the pressure he felt to do so. 
Coaches at his high school had to implement a 15 touch per game rule for Odin to get him to be more assertive. GMs are currently saying he doesn't fully dominate the way someone his size should. Maybe he can grow into it, right? But there's more than enough caution signs by this point to show that Odin is not the foolproof plan he's been made out to be. A lot of basketball is physical, and he doesn't even 100% check the box there with his potential for injury, but the mental part absolutely cannot be overstated. By the way, Durant has just had one of the best workouts the Blazers GM has said he's ever seen in their building, ever. Meanwhile, Odin's workout is described to be spotty. Is he truly the safe, sure bet over KD? Or is it just his massive frame giving off the illusion that he could be more than he'd ever go on to become? Still, none of that seems to be enough to pick skinny Kevin Durant to lead the way into the future with Brandon Roy. The simple facts are that, for the moment, the mind believes what the eyes see. And the eyes see the perfect successor in a long line of historically dominant big men. Plus, how would it look in 10 years if they let him pass by? And then everyone's wondering why they didn't choose what seemed to be the obvious option. Thus, with the number one pick, the Portland Trailblazers select Greg Oden from Ohio State with absolutely no regrets. But this next part is ambiguous. Was Oden's body due to fall apart as quickly as it did, or did Portland's management speed up that process? Remember, to that point, Oden had never actually had a knee injury. Again, the only major surgery he'd had was that hip procedure as a middle schooler. But as a result of one of his legs being shorter than the other, the team gave him what was called an orthotic insert, which was basically a pad to wear inside of his shoe that would even out the length of his legs as to prevent future injuries. Again, it kind of seems like knowing that could be a problem, he really was not the sure thing. But get this next part, just three weeks after wearing and using that insert, Odin is found to require microfracture knee surgery, and this is with no history of knee injuries. Yes, if you didn't know, Odin's initial surgery took place before his rookie season even started. And around that time, everything was positive coming from the Blazers camp. They talked of how the area of his knee affected was as small as a fingernail, and that the rest of his knee was beautiful. So there were high hopes for a full recovery and no future complications. And although there was never a way to prove that the insert caused the initial injury, when he finally did make his debut in the NBA, apparently he was wearing an insert that sat his foot high enough that his ankle stuck out of his high top shoes. Just 13 minutes into that debut, he sprained his foot, leading to a three week absence. Safe to say his career was off to the wrong foot, and that's unfortunate. Because if things had worked out the way Portland's doctor expected it to after the surgery, just maybe they would have entered a golden era. Aldridge, Roy, and Oden only ever played 62 games together through two seasons. But their record was an outstanding 52-10 when they did play. I would say that if Oden had have lived up to the expectations that his workout set, he and Aldridge alone could have made the Blazers a force to be reckoned with, because obviously Brandon Roy didn't last long either, so that wasn't happening either way. And that's precisely what would have made Durant the perfect pick for Portland. Even after losing Roy, Durant and Aldridge would have been an amazing starting point for future contention in the Western Conference. But now that's no more than another giant what if on a long list of them. The important part to remember out of all of this is the human element though. Those injuries really did a number on Odin's mental state as he was going through them. In December of 2009, just as he was showing potential to reach his expectations, he collided with Aaron Brooks in midair which left his kneecap gruesomely shattered. And after, he never played another game in Portland. In an interview last year, he admitted that the expectations and knowing that he'd be the Sam Bowie to Kevin Durant's Michael Jordan ate away at him, particularly because he felt helpless. He mentioned that at a point, drinking alone at night became a habit and alcohol and pills became the only way he could fall asleep. He'd gone on to pursue the life his body pushed him towards, and was now dealing with the failure of the expectations that same body had set. So through all of that, what became of Odin? Well, three years later, he resurfaced as a member of the Miami Heat where he came fairly close to finessing a ring. Would have been a nice consolation for all that he went through. But after that stint was over, there was no Derrick Rose type resurgence despite his efforts. His body constantly in pain through regular daily motions, the weight of all those surgeries. At that point, the goal seemed to be to leave the game of basketball on his own terms. In 2015, he landed workouts with the Mavericks and Hornets, but nothing came of either situation, so he finished his playing days in China. 
To him, it was simply about coming to peace with that part of his life and leaving the competitive scene with his dignity. And with those goals in mind, he did accomplish that. He says that it was a milestone to even be able to get back in shape to play at a high level. And as far as the modern day, surprisingly, he just popped up back in last month's news cycle for some positive reasons. He'll be graduating from Ohio State in May, which is amazing for him considering that was probably what he preferred to the NBA from the start. And just a month ago, it was reported that he again entered into Ice Cube's Big 3 draft after not being selected last year. The league has expanded and added more franchises, so the odds are better now than they were then. But that's all that seems to be floating out there at the moment. There isn't a verdict yet as to if he qualified for Ice Cube's league, and no further information as to if that's his way of trying to get back into professional basketball. I don't know, but after hearing his life story, seeing that he had three microfracture surgeries and is already in his 30s with five years away from the NBA, I'd have to doubt he's seriously fielding an attempt to get back into the NBA. It seems like that's a chapter of his life that's long been closed. Meanwhile, Durant is still being ridden. He's gearing up to make his third title run with Golden State. And what happens after that is anyone's guess. New York? LA? Nobody has a clue what he plans to write in these next chapters. But as far as where his story started, I think we can all agree now that it probably should have been in Portland. Finally, I'd like to thank Squarespace for sponsoring this video, which is a service that allows you to create your own website, domain, or online store. Squarespace is an amazing tool if you've ever been interested in creating a website because you don't need any type of special skills or knowledge about code and all of the other things that may seem intimidating. I was running a 2K website many years ago and it probably would have came out 100 times better if I was working with Squarespace. In particular, they have very professional templates for your site to get you started, so that you don't just have to come up with designs out of thin air and I'd say that was probably the part I was struggling most with when I was creating my site. Being able to have some type of guidance with professional templates and then being able to add your own preference will definitely get you the desired results. So head over to squarespace.com through the links in the comment section and the description and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com dom2k to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain.